Welcome to the K-12 online conference. My name is David Jakes and I'm here to talk about reimagining the spaces in which we learn. This presentation is broken into four videos and previously I've talked to you about the mindset uh, around the, or that's associated with creating new spaces. We also talked about the landscape of learning space design which was which focused on understanding the shifts and changes in learning and how spaces can respond to that. And then in this video we're going to be addressing process because you need a process. And learning spaces, as we mentioned, is, is predicated on the, on the thought that what do you want the student learning experience to be and how do we shape spaces accordingly? And so that requires a thoughtful and dedicated and intentional step-by-step -step process that can help you do that. And that process is design. I'll explore that more with you in, in a bit, but first some language. And I've been working with you over the course of the first two videos in understanding a new kind of vocabulary associated with space. And so we want to continue that work and deepen it. So the first idea is that spaces should exist as an ecology. In other words, they're connected. And that spaces should not exist in isolation. So learning spaces, when you design them, you just don't design classrooms, but you want to design a spatial ecology. And how do, the, how do all these pieces fit together to support the definition or the development of that uh, learning experience as you've defined? So there's classrooms, there's libraries, there's maker spaces, there's informal spaces, think hallways here. Uh, and then there's, and for all those four spaces, and there's probably more, but there is a physical face-to-face -face kind of context and a digital context that can exist with all those spaces. So the first idea, the first notion of a, of a, of a more developed kind of uh, broader view of learning spaces is that they exist in ecology and they all work together to accomplish that manifestation of that student learning experience that you want. The second idea is that is that spaces at, at any one given time should be able to range across a, a, a range of behaviors. And what I mean by that is I want you to think of attention, right? On one side we've got academic, on the other side we've got social. And so spaces should, you know, any space should be able to negotiate that or support any kind of behavior across that range from academic to social. It's an interesting design idea, okay? Likewise, it should support a range from formal to informal interactions. So in other words, if you have a library and you've got two or three classes that might be scheduled into that library, that's a very formal kind of experience. As opposed to where the library is open, perhaps after school or during the day, where kids come in and self-select into spaces and self-select the kind of learning that they want to do. That's much more of an informal kind of an arrangement that's not, that's not scheduled or something like that. Uh, spaces can also or should support individual to collaborative work. So in other words, think of a classroom where you might have students engaged individually uh, and then they may come together with the peers to engage in some kind of collaborative kind of effort. Uh, along the same lines, you have analog to digital. So we've got paper-based kind of experience, traditional kinds of experience that range all the way to digital kind of experiences with technology. So spaces should be able to support both very analog kinds of experiences and experiences that allow us to make use of one-to-one -one technologies and things like that. And then the final tension is an interesting one is that how does, how does learning in the spaces in which kids learn, uh, how does that look across a range from school to home and everywhere in between? In the previous video I mentioned third places in those informal social locations that kids inhabit like Starbucks beyond either school or home. And so there's a tension there that where kids have a full range of abilities to inhabit different kinds of experiences in different kinds of spaces given uh, any moment in time. Let's continue with some more vocabulary. Uh, all right, so we've got seven different ideas here. First of all, you've got flexible spaces and agile spaces. The flexible space, if, you're, if your classroom's flexible, then it means it can be reshaped quickly. Uh, the interesting idea about that is that that's typically associated with being able to rearrange furniture in sort of a horizontal plane. And one of the things you should understand about or realize about new spaces that are designed is height adjustable furniture, uh, standing desks and things like that. So we can talk about being flexible or being agile uh, in either a horizontal plane or a vertical plane. And what I mean by agile is if flexible is the ability to rearrange, agility is, is the ability to do it quickly or, or the velocity associated with it. So you can have a flexible space, really heavy furniture that you could move, but it might not be very agile because you can't do it very quickly. So the goal is to have a very flexible, agile kind of space 
that allows it to be adaptive. And there's two ways to look at this. One is that adaptive is, is spaces, a combination of being flexible, flexible and agile, but also realizing that spaces are designed based on the student experience, that in 10 years or in, maybe in five years, that as your expectations for where do, what you want the student experience to be change, your spaces are still capable and being uh, enough to be able to support that. So they're flexible and ag agile enough. In other words, they're future-proofed, right? So we want to think about spaces and create spaces that have a timeline probably of 15 to 20 years, literally, where there are viable spaces that can morph and adjust as the institution's values and beliefs are reshaped around learning what learning means. It's too expensive when you're talking about spatial redesign to look at a time frame that's less when considering that that furniture alone in your typical 800 square foot classroom in the United States may cost anywhere from uh, maybe between 12,000 and 25,000 US dollars. So you have to uh, be wise. That's why we need a process for this and creating adaptive uh, spaces that are flexible and agile are part of that. Certainly technological spaces, what kind of technology do you have? That's a, that's a given. Uh, and then that technology allows spaces to be interconnected so I'm really intrigued as a designer about the role and the linkage between physical spaces that are maybe school-based uh, or beyond that are linked with digital spaces that support the work. And one provocation I have for you to think about is when will the, the notion of a digital space and the learning that takes place there be of equal importance to schools as the physical space is now? We're not there yet, certainly, but hopefully we can make steps and, and go in that direction. The intentional component of this, of spaces, that is intimately and inherently linked to the student learning experience. That's a given, and that makes, in, in doing that, uh, goes a long way in achieving everything that we've talked about to this point. And then finally, um, spaces should be personalized. And in other words, they should allow for personal interpretations of how the space supports learning. So as you walk into a space, you know, the you know, students should be able to pick and choose not perhaps all the time, but at some times they should be able to arrange the space according to how they think it supports their learning. You know, grant them agency and the ability to to define their own space from time to time, and that's and that's a big part of being flexible and agile and about a new kind of mindset and lens for how space supports learning. So, given that, let's uh, let's just jump into this into designing learning spaces, and here's the process. And we see a couple. Uh, pieces of some icons there. We're going to fill this in. So the very first part of spatial design involves discovery. Okay, and what I mean by that is is that discovery is a process that's inclusive, that asks the right questions, that explores what learning looks like. And this might mean talking with students, talking with parents, talking with teachers, talking with admins, talking with faculty, talking with maintenance people, cafeteria people, everybody. And so when you start to design learning spaces, a process begins with a complete discovery of all the information surrounding the provocation. In this case, it's maybe changing a, a classroom or changing classrooms. What might that look like? So you have to talk with everybody on that. Okay. And this means that th where design comes into play is having uh, a group of people or a designer help you with this in terms of supporting the process that uncovers the right information. So you just don't want to go buy furniture. Okay, don't do that. Please don't do that. Engage in a process where you you first talk to everybody about learning, what you want learning to be. Okay, and then that from there, what you do is then you take that and you use that information to define your expectations for learning. And these may be five to six statements, ten statements that direct what learning should look like. So at this particular point, <clears throat> excuse me, you've gone through a process where you've talked with everybody, uncovered all the really rich information about learning and, and its possibilities and its opportunities. And you shape that, shape that down into declarative statements that provide a framework, literally the DNA of, of your student learning experience. And what that does is provides you with direction and intent in terms of how spaces can be designed. From that, the next step is ideation and creating potential ways in which you can take those six to 10 factors that you want learning to be and shape them into new sp spatial realities. So in other words, now we start to lay out space designs, okay? And what we do is we create prototypes. And prototypes are plausible futures. 
They're not perfect, but they are good enough to be put into play and put under pressure with kids and teachers and see what come, comes out of that. Now, you can have one prototype or a number of prototypes. But the, but the important thing to remember here is that this process assumes that you're going to prototype something and test it. Please do not rush to solution when it comes to learning spaces. The financial investment is way too much to be able to do that. So what you have to do is take your time, engage in a process, do it step by step, and you have to prototype your different classrooms or prototype your library or, or you have to take steps to test your ideas that result from the ideation process. And finally, when you get those prototypes in, what you're going to do is you're going to implement that. Once you come ba back with the prototypes, okay, you're going to you're going to implement that prototype, put it into play, and continue to test that. And what happens then is as you ideate and create prototypes and put them into play in schools, then that arrow means that this is an iterative process. So at the end of the first prototype, after the end of the first implement, I'm sorry, after the end of the first implementation, you might see that prototype one is your is your best option out of three, perhaps. And you go back and continue to ideate to make it better, and you put it through, create a second prototype, uh, and then you implement that second prototype. And you keep doing this until you get to the point where you feel comfortable with that your solution can be taken to scale, and that you know you've done the testing, you've done the investigation, you've done the observations that tell you that your design is a solid one and one that will work for your school. So the process of design in terms of spaces begins with discovery, where you collect all the information, and that information is then defined into a set of what's called design drivers that are the DNA of in the framework that provides your expectations for learning. You take those those ideas then those drivers and start becoming very creative in what they could look like and how they can be shaped from those ideas you assemble those into prototypes which are plausible futures of what the space could look like you might have three prototypes you might have two and you put those into play and you implement those with kids in under the pressure of teaching and learning and you learn from that and you go back and iterate and ideate and say this didn't work how might we rethink what didn't work into a new strategy and build that into a second prototype and test and continue the process till we get to a, a final solution that represents a design that we can take to scale. So it looks like this. Take a look at this classroom. Uh, I'm not going to mention where this is, but this is a, a typical kind of classroom with lots of kids uh, and flexible seating. It's got some really nice day lighting, that window. It's got some high ceilings. The lighting is your typical fluorescent um, kind of condition we see in schools. And this is, this is a, a, in my experience, a very traditional kind of, of, of space. And so, again, what do we want the experience to be? You know, that's the provocation. That's the challenge. So here's discovery. So we start asking kids, and we start doing visitations and observations and a lot of ethnography techniques about what this space could look like and or what the experience could be. And we do that with kids. We then do that with teachers, and there's a wide range of different opportunities that we can do with teachers to say these are the possibilities uh, of, of what spaces could look like so we're looking with teachers administrators we're looking we're working with um, all staff we're working with parents but we're, what we're doing is we're, we're putting them through a series of, of design techniques that will allow us to understand uh, what they want for the student learning experience and when you get all that information we go to a defined process and the defined process then looks like this where we come up with, in this case, a seven different design drivers that become part of the everyday experience. And that spaces are existing in ecology and that there's virtual connections to learning, that, that we shift from a classroom to a studio model. And that we use this space to inform our culture of spaces, encourage everyone to rethink spaces. We build in choice, we build in connected spaces and that there is a definite invitation into the space and we're thoughtful and creative about how we invite learners into a space. What does the space inform the learner to the intent of learner, the learning that's expected as you walk in? That's called a threshold experience. And so um, we, we took all that information we got by talking with people and engaging them in different creative ways. And then what we did is we took that information and shaped it into a direction, a series of what are called design drivers that form the DNA and the framework for design. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that and take the available space and now start working with different potential arrangements. We're gonna start thinking about how do we connect and start thinking about invitation and connectedness and technology and culture and start reshaping this space. This is one of their, uh, a potential uh, prototype uh, for, 
for one of the spaces, uh, and this is also a steel case implementation. It's really a terrific um, uh, with a wide, wide variety of furniture that gives multiple kinds of ways in which to interact. You see uh, uh, whiteboards on the left wall and uh, that are portable. Uh, those are the steel case verb series, and then on the right you see some traditional whiteboard space. In the back, you might you see some campfire series. Those are those are um, light enough. Those those they're like L-shaped gray things that you pick, can pick up and move and reshape into uh, a temporary sort of semi-private space. Uh, they are transparent enough that teachers can see through to manage students and so on. It allows kids to define space. So this might be one potential option as you start ideating and thinking about ways in which spaces can be created. You can also use the same furniture to create this, some more of a fishbowl kind of activity, and you can also create something like this. And the, really, the combinations, the arrangement of these things, uh, it, it goes on and on. Um, and so what we're doing here is is we're starting to think about and being real creative about the way in which these spaces can be created to support the development of the expectations as de as defined by the, the drivers of learning. So that continues on. We work with teachers and now you see the teachers actively using in planning, using knowing the fact that we've got this furniture in this space, and we know what learning we want learning to look like. How can we create uh, different kinds of designs that allow us to to achieve that? So you see teachers now becoming the designers I talked about in an earlier video, uh, and that's an important thing. And they're actually working to craft a set of different kinds of spatial layouts, five to six perhaps that they can begin with to understand so that they can put that into play and prototype those designs in that space. So what the teachers are doing here is they're actually using that steel case furniture and that's one of the prototypes and so what they're doing is coming up with the different kinds of arrangements that they think would work for them and what they're going to do is then test those uh, designs with kids to see what worked. And so now teachers not only are, are educators but they're now become designers and they're going to go put these into play and test them and they're becoming ethnographers so we see this really this really dramatic shift in what teachers can become think about this educator designer and ethnographer is a really robust kind of role for teachers and something that helps them to become much more nuanced and capable of designing spaces that work for kids so uh, what they're doing they're developing those prototypes you see here's another uh, example of that and, and here is another example. We want teachers to begin learning how to sketch. You know, this is a prototype, right? So we don't want to have to do really, really deep diagrams, but what we want to do is sketch it out how it might look, given the furniture that's in place. This is uh, an example of in the first and the upper left, one, two, three, and four. You have an individual work where then, then the tables and the, the furniture is assembled into collaborative pairs of two, then the collaborative pairs of four, and then whole class instruction. And so when you're talking about uh, a flexible, agile space in you know, a typical class period of, say, 50 minutes, think about the opportunity and in, in the pedagogical processes that are required, the instructional methodologies that are required, and the understanding that's required to take a space and have four different spatial arrangements within the context of a, of a single class period. That's when we start talking about things in really cool ways to design new conditions for learning when the spaces are flexible, agile, and adaptive enough to be able to support multiple arrangements within a single uh, learning period. And so once we go through all these prototypes and start seeing what works and what doesn't, you know, we go back and we test and implement, we continue to build that out. And one of the things that I'm very, very big on is, is creating uh, a playbook uh, in, in, in a shared kind of understanding across, or, or across teachers of how spaces can work. So what if, what if you had a pilot group or a prototype group of 10 teachers and they all came up with, with 40 different kinds of designs and tested those? And could you assemble what worked and what didn't work and, and actually create a playbook in a, in a way in which we have a cultural um, way to capture and describe how spaces support learning in our school? And it literally becomes uh, an instruction manual, as much as I hate to say that, but it becomes a way in which all teachers can share their expertise a way you build a community-based expectation for teaching and learning in space and where you start to develop a culture where spaces become the third teacher of kids. And so the process itself is one that's, and we talk about the process and go back and, re, and think about that, it's inclusive, right? That discovery process at the beginning uh, ask every, asks everybody to participate and contribute their ideas. And the focus of that then is a focus on learning. And out of that discovery approach, 
The definition part of the process defines that focus on learning by, by creating spatial design drivers, the framework, the DNA that I mentioned. From there, you know, we want to take those ideas and ideate. We want to create prototypes and we want to put them into play. We want to test them and evaluate our best guesses at how these spaces could support learning. And we want to get better at it. And so that, that to do that, we have to iterate and just continually going through this cycle of constant, continual improvement. The one thing that I do want to mention that I forgot to mention earlier is that don't engage um, in spatial design without considering the needs of teachers. Uh, we need some professional development here. And for example, you would never think of going into a one-to-one -one program and releasing that without considering professional development opportunities for teachers and how they might learn to become better educators with the use of technology. But what you see in spaces and we, with spatial change is that the changes are made and there's no consideration of learning for teachers to understand how that happens. In a process that's defined and created for learning space change means that you have to help teachers understand those shifts that are necessary. So moving forward with that means that you are intentional about professional development because if you're not, there's no guarantee that they'll take that flexible and agile furniture and they'll just rearrange it back into rows where kids are sitting in rows. So spatial change guarantees one thing, the kids are going to be sitting in more comfortable seating. And so you have to work hard at, at preparing teachers for the changes. Think about the opportunity to, to have four different arrangements within a single class period. That's disruptive. That's pretty cool, though. And so helping them understand is, is, is very meaningful and, in, 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 of course, essential. And if you do that, you start building up your culture. You start to begin uh, crafting a new kind of experience for teaching and learning. And that's what we're looking at here with spatial change. So up next, uh, we're going to be talking about the impact of all this. I hope you enjoyed this series uh, up to this point, and I hope you join me for the fourth video.